Hiroshima, 40 years ago, August 6, 1945, the atomic bomb, the most powerful weapon ever, exploded. Hiroshima today, the memorial not far from ground zero, commemorating the more than 100,000 who died, a silent symbol of the awful possibilities of the nuclear age. Good evening, I'm Tom Brokaw, this is NBC Nightly News, a special edition, Hiroshima, 40 years later. It is now Tuesday morning, August 6th in Japan, 40 years after a fleet of American B-29s approached that city, carrying a bomb only a few people knew existed. It was dropped and exploded 1,900 feet above Hiroshima. The damage, even today, is difficult to comprehend. 50,000 people, including guests from around the world, are gathering for ceremonies that will mark the hour, 8.16 a.m., August 6, 1945. A number of prominent Americans, including many American mayors, Jack Lemmon and Leonard Bernstein, have been invited to participate. Throughout this program tonight, we'll be devoting a good deal of our time to the lessons of Hiroshima, past, present, and future. President Reagan chose this day to disclose that the bump removed from his nose last week was, in fact, a common skin cancer, non-threatening. The president told reporters at an informal Oval Office news conference that tests showed that it was a basal cell carcinoma, a low-grade cancer that has been showing up on more and more Americans in recent years. More now from Chris Wallace at the White House. It was the second time in three weeks the public learned about a presidential cancer. Mr. Reagan using an Oval Office news conference to disclose that a bump removed from the right side of his nose last week turned out to be malignant. It is a form of cancer. This is the, as I say, the commonest, the uh, least dangerous. Nancy had one removed above her upper lip some time ago. They're very commonplace. Uh, uh, they do not betoken in any way that you are cancer prone. The president said he had a basal cell carcinoma. According to doctors, there are 400,000 cases of such non-threatening skin cancer each year, and almost all are cured by removal. Mr. Reagan seemed most upset by the fact that exposure to sunlight appears to be a factor in such cancers. Aide said that, like his wife, he will now wear a hat and put on a sunblock when at his ranch. It is a little heartbreaking for me to find out, though, because all my life I've uh, lived with a coat of tan, but now I'm told that I must not expose myself to the sun anymore. There's been confusion about this case since reporters noticed a mark on the president's nose last week. Spokesman Larry Speaks first suggested a biopsy had been performed. But Mrs. Reagan said no. The bump was checked only for infection. The White House added to the confusion by then imposing a news blackout. The president said today he didn't learn until this weekend that doctors had done a biopsy and found cancer. A dermatologist said this malignancy is not a sign that Mr. Reagan's colon cancer has spread. It's unlikely that the skin cancer on his nose is in any way, shape, or form related to the cancer that he had in his colon. I think it's coincidence. White House officials are confident the president will soon be over his two bouts with cancer and ready to launch a fall offensive for his programs. But they are also sensitive to Mr. Reagan's health as never before, and they realize that everyone else is, too. Chris Wallace, NBC News, at the White House. The president also said today that he is still opposed to the idea of economic sanctions against South Africa, but he said he would wait before deciding to veto any such bills passed by Congress. The president did concede that some steps that Congress is now considering might be helpful, but he would not identify those steps. Also coming up in this program tonight, Robert Hager in Dallas on the mystery of the crash of Flight 191. We'll have the latest on the prospects for a baseball strike, and I'll be interviewing Japanese Prime Minister Nakasone as part of our coverage of Hiroshima. The continuing investigation into that fatal Delta Airlines crash in Dallas has turned up evidence that orders from the control tower may have, may have contributed to the accident. Robert Hager reports on this and other questions that remain unanswered tonight. Investigators here are concentrating on two possible explanations for the crash. First, the severe thunderstorm that developed so fast it caught both pilots and air controllers off guard. 
Second, a spacing problem between a private Learjet landing first and the Delta flight behind it. Controllers kept trying to speed up the Lear and asked the Delta flight four different times to slow down. If, as investigators suspect, the Delta flight was hit with a wind shear, a microburst or downdraft of wind, the fact that it was going slower could have made it impossible to pull up and avoid the crash. Admiral Patrick Bursley of the National Transportation Safety Board says this was bad for the Delta pilot. To the degree that uh, he was operating at a slow, slower speed, he was not operating in this optimal situation for an encounter. So that could very well have played a, a major role in the accident. It, we have to look at that intensively. We, we can't walk away from that question. Examination of the cockpit voice recorder shows no conversation to indicate the crew was alarmed about the storm. The flight data recorder indicates the crew did apply maximum power at the last moment, but it was too late. To that point, Survivor Juanita Williams described the severity of the storm. Seen. It was a blinding rain. It rained so hard we could not even see. Thunder and lightning I had never in my 55 years heard. Important areas for investigation now, why the plane's crew wasn't more concerned with the storm developing in front of it, and why the Dallas-Fort Worth airport and airports all across the country aren't better equipped to detect wind shear or microbursts. Dallas-Fort Worth has the wind shear alert system used at most airports. Six wind meters around the field, which in this case sounded no alarm until ten minutes after the accident. Much more advanced Doppler radar has been developed to display rainfall, heaviest here, turbulence, heaviest here, and wind direction. In this case, different colors indicate wind shear here. But it's currently being used at only one airport in Memphis. Further distribution is awaiting federal funding. Meantime, experts agree wind shear remains the greatest single danger to aircraft today. Robert Hager, NBC News, Dallas. And as tomorrow's deadline approaches, all signs tonight point to a strike in Major League Baseball. As Richard Valeriani reports now, the two sides met briefly today, but there was little progress. The Chicago Cubs and New York Mets played what could be one of the final games of the 1985 Major League Baseball season, barring some 11th hour heroics at the bargaining table. Negotiators for the owners and players met secretly for 90 minutes somewhere here in Manhattan, but they struck out again in their efforts to reach a settlement. So are you going to have a strike, it looks like? Unless something changes, yeah, sure we are. Salary arbitration is one of the main issues dividing the two sides. The owners want new rules for arbitration to hold down salary increases. The players oppose any restraint on salaries. The two sides also disagree on how much of the owners' broadcasting revenues should go to the players' pension fund. If there is a strike, it would mean major losses for major league cities. New York officials calculate that if no more games are played at Yankee Stadium and Shea Stadium this year, the city's economy would lose more than $61 million. Unlike 1981, the owners do not have strike insurance this year, but any precise determination of their potential strike losses vanishes in a maze of confusing accounting devices. Star players like Mets outfielder George Foster would stop getting fat paychecks. His comes to an estimated $37,500 a week. Rookies like Yankees outfielder Dan Pasqua will lose about $769 a week. Thousands of workers who depend on baseball for their income will also lose. Bob Baxter sells food near Chicago's Wrigley Field. Uh, it'd be disastrous, not just only for us, but just for everybody around the ballpark. However, the biggest loser could be baseball itself. Attendance is at an all-time high this season, but fans are turned off by the dispute between rich players and very rich owners. And it's the fans who may take a walk when the strike is over. Richard Valeriani, NBC News, New York. Ted Turner's bid to buy CBS stalled last week, and so today Turner announced that he is negotiating now to take over the MGM United Artists Entertainment Company. This appears to be a friendly takeover bid. MGM's owner is willing to sell the company, but Turner must sell him back United Artists. The first member of the alleged Walker spy ring went on trial today in Norfolk, Virginia. Retired Navy Lieutenant Commander Arthur Walker has admitted his involvement in the case, but as Carl Stern reports now, his lawyers argue there is no evidence the Walkers were engaged in espionage. Arthur Walker arrived for the trial thinner and without his toupee and prepared to gamble that the government couldn't prove its case. He decided to waive a jury trial and let the judge decide. His lawyer said there was no proof that he'd done more than photograph some classified documents for his brother John, the alleged spy ring leader. There's been no communication of uh, 
or evidence of communication of this information to the Soviets or to any foreign power. Uh, they, at best, we think, will be able to show that it went to his brother, but beyond that, it's pure speculation as to where it went. As testimony began, a military contractor described Walker as an outstanding employee, though he had trouble identifying him in the courtroom without his toupee. Records were introduced showing Walker had signed out the classified documents he was accused of photographing. But another witness said the records Walker photographed of equipment breakdowns on Navy ships were handled later as unimportant. In fact, a receipt showed they were sent back to the Navy by United Parcel Service without any security precautions. The documents concerned some helicopter ships and two command ships, this one, the USS Blue Ridge. Such data made it possible to estimate the readiness of the entire Navy, claimed the prosecutor. Walker's lawyers said he meant no harm. He didn't intend to injure the United States or any foreign country, but he probably did some things that, in retrospect, he shouldn't have done and he's sorry for. The trial resumes tomorrow with the government trying to prove how much harm Arthur Walker did. Carl Stern, NBC News, Norfolk. Meanwhile, through blueberry fields, muddy farms, and dense forests, more than 2,000 law enforcement officers made their way to marijuana crops around the nation today. Their mission? To search out and destroy the illegal weed. In Arkansas, Attorney General Edwin Meese flew with drug agents to draw attention to the operation called Delta 9. At an airport hangar, he posed with some of the day's harvest. In Georgia, the operation had a military look. Officials said that roughly 12% of the marijuana consumed in this country is now grown in the United States. The Alaska State Senate today decided there was insufficient evidence to impeach Governor Bill Sheffield. The Democratic governor was accused of a conflict of interest involving the award of a state leasing contract. Though the move to impeach him failed, a resolution was introduced questioning Sheffield's performance and his credibility. Hiroshima. Today, a woman who survived that bombing recalled how her daughter went off to work on that day 40 years ago. I'm still waiting for her to come home, she said. Hiroshima, 40 years later, is profoundly personal. It is also political, of course. Mayors of 100 cities have gathered there. Steve Mallory reports tonight on how the people in Hiroshima are spending this day. Dawn, Hiroshima's Peace Memorial Park. Some of the survivors of the world's first atom bomb attack. Hibaksha, as they're called, came to pray. Hibaksha means explosion affected people. They pay their respects at the Mound to the Unknown Dead, where the ashes of at least 70,000 people are interred. Most Hibaksha shun the official ceremony. They consider it too political. Too much said about nuclear weapons. Not enough done for the Hibaksha. Every year since the bombing, people have come to this site, long before it was Peace Park, to observe the anniversary of the bombing. For many at this time of year, Hiroshima has become a symbol for commemoration, for protest. Most protest the continuing buildup of nuclear weapons. One group circles the park's atomic dome with anti-nuclear messages. These Buddhists fast for peace. However, the message of this caravan is that of a right-wing fanatical group calling for Japan to rearm, to develop nuclear weapons. But for most, the observances are solemn. At Hiroshima's Noborimachi Catholic Church, there is a mass for peace. Some have come here to search city records for newly discovered information about the fate of a friend or relative they lost track of 40 years ago. At Suet Mukai finally confirmed what she had feared. Her mother died shortly after the bombing. For others, the search never ends. Steve Mallory, NBC News, Hiroshima. In a speech prepared for today's ceremonies, Japanese Prime Minister Nakasone said that he will hold his country to its non-nuclear principles, that Japan will never have or use nuclear weapons. Nakasone was a young Japanese naval officer when the Hiroshima bomb was dropped, and he saw the cloud. I asked the Prime Minister what he remembers. At the time, I happened to be in a port in the vicinity of Hiroshima. And I saw what looked like a thundercloud rising up into the sky. And I initially thought that perhaps an ammunition dump had blown up. Did you understand the significance of the explosion at that time, that this was the most powerful bomb ever invented? My father-in-law was a physicist, and he had told me about the atomic bomb. 
So, although the Japanese government used the term special type of bomb, I instinctively knew that it was an atomic bomb. Ever since then, the image of that cloud has been carved indelibly in my mind. Prime Minister, there has been a great debate in this country for 40 years now about whether it was a wise decision to drop the bomb on Hiroshima. Those people who support the decision say that it, in effect, saved Japan from itself. A land invasion by the United States was eminent, and the Japanese were determined to fight to the last possible person. I know this is a difficult proposition and a difficult question, but is it conceivable that the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima, in fact, did save Japan from itself? I consider that the dropping of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were, from the point of view of the Japanese people, inhumane acts. They were indiscriminate attacks on cities and their civilian populations in violation of international law. I believe they were acts that never should have taken place. I also believe that we, as politicians, should exert all possible efforts to see that this sort of unfortunate thing never happens again. Prime Minister, so far as I know, you're the only world leader now in power who has ever witnessed a nuclear explosion, especially a hostile nuclear explosion. Do you ever discuss it with other world leaders when you gather to talk with them about the problems of this globe? Every time I travel abroad, I always call for the eradication of nuclear weapons from the face of the earth. All the people of Japan are constantly raising their voices and calling for no more Hiroshimas, no more Nagasaki's. The purging of atomic weapons from the face of the earth is the ardent prayer of the Japanese people and their government. Back in a moment with a special segment report on the surrender shock that still exists in Japan 40 years after Hiroshima. On special segment tonight, surrender shock. What for many Japanese was deep and lasting psychological pain brought on by Hiroshima that they were forced to give up, to surrender. As Lloyd Dobbins reminds us tonight, however, Hiroshima was so powerful as an explosion and as an event it short-circuited many memories of what Japan had been doing during the war. They live in Sanya, Tokyo's Skid Row, and they drink cheap rice wine. Among them are several hundred who are here because Japan lost World War II, and everything they had believed proved false. What little help the old soldiers get comes from an alcohol treatment center run by Father John Meany, a merry no old priest. Uh, you got a few who were alcoholics by the time they got there, and they, you know, will tell you they don't remember much of the war. But, uh, you know, the others uh, were fine until the, finally that surrender shock hit them, and uh, they just couldn't handle it. Japanese soldiers were told and believed that it was better to die than surrender. Young men would drink a last toast and fly off to crash their planes into American ships. Suicide pilots. At home, women and children were taught to attack armed invaders with bamboo spears. That, too, would have been suicidal, but they would have done it. Nobuko Ueno was a 19-year-old schoolgirl happily training. Emperor, you know, we told, you know, uh, is a living God, you see. Uh, we should, you know, uh, die for Emperor, you know, willingly. And I uh, never doubt, you know, I, I was happy, you know, to die. Americans saw that fanaticism on Okinawa. 12,000 Americans died, so did 150,000 Japanese, half of them civilians. The accepted estimate at that time was that a million Americans and 10 million Japanese would be killed or wounded if the main islands were invaded. American authorities believed dropping the bomb would kill fewer and end the war quicker. The bombing of Hiroshima overshadowed everything that had happened during the war, including the Japanese atrocities. In Nanking, China, invading Japanese had slaughtered 300,000 people. But Nanking was in a past age that died here when, in that instant, in this city, the nuclear age began. Perhaps 70,000 people died instantly and another 40,000 within a year. In all, 350,000 people are alive today who were hurt by the bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Many still show scars of burns and past operations, and they have a greater than average risk of cancer. 
they are entitled to free medical care, and many of them are treated at the A-bomb hospital in Hiroshima. The average age of the patients is 70. This year, many of the people learned from a Hiroshima television documentary that the city had been a major military target, not a random victim as they had fought. Tazu Shibama, a survivor, believes the bombing was only part of the war. It is just a reasonable thing for America to do it because America was stronger than Japan. If Japan was stronger, maybe Japan did the same thing on the other side. Because of World War II, Japan's military today is restricted to a defensive role. It does not have any nuclear weapons, and the military budget is kept deliberately low. Money the government has not spent on its military force has helped build one of the world's strongest economies. But not for everyone. Some few still have not recovered from the surrender. Lloyd Dobbins, NBC News, Hiroshima. One of the remarkable lessons of Hiroshima is that 40 years later we're still struggling to understand the event itself, the bombing and the powerful, frightening new age that it introduced. Except for these occasions, when we're forced to face the terrible realities of the nuclear age, we have a difficult time coping with the magnitude of that awful force hidden away in silos and packed into other warheads. Then Hiroshima reminds us of what, by modern standards, a relatively small nuclear explosion can do. Hiroshima reminds us as well that however much we may wish it would all go away, it will not. The nuclear age is not an abstract theory. It is our reality which if we choose to ignore, we do so at our peril. That's Nightly News for Monday. I'm Tom Brokaw. I'll see you tomorrow night.